You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Post-Thanksgiving show, uh, it's not like there's a ton of stuff going on with the White Sox, but there's a lot of things that we can talk about when it comes to Chicago sports franchises uh, comparing all of them to the White Sox. We can get into the winter meetings coming up next week as well. But the big news, my friend, is a a non-White Sox thing that still, as a Sox fan, I think we all understand it. I think there's been so many parallels between the Sox and the Bears this year. And even even to the point where Pedro Grafal stuck around for about the same percentage of the season as Matt Eberfuss. Like, I saw that recently. It wasn't an exact number. But if you take the percentage of the baseball season and the percentage of the NFL season, it took about as long, comparably, for the organizations to move on from terrible coaches. It was two guys that were, it was so obvious that they sucked at their job. I mean, think about the Commanders game. That should have been the moment right there. You already knew he sucked coming into the season, much like the White Sox knew that Pedro sucked coming into the season, right? And you get that Commander's game. And I was out that night. I was out with some friends. Basically, I was meeting new friends. I'm sitting with a group of people that I'm trying to give a good impression to. And I watched the end of that game, and the passion in me comes out, and I just start screaming at the TV. And then I sat there and brooded for an hour. And later heard, you know, my friends liked you but you brooded a little bit because of how they lost that game, right? Well, yeah, and then how do you not brood after that? I brooded after that game I to the point where, you know, I was I was with my family for the rest of the day, and they're all kind of looking at me like, what's your problem? What is your problem? Why are you acting that way? Because yeah. of the Bears? The Bears would make me act that way? So, so here's the thing. Like, I was upset about that at that moment, and that should have been the instance right then and there. When you've got a player on your team in the corner of the end zone, not looking at the play, waving his arms around, and you could have called timeout because you saw that your player wasn't ready, but you didn't. How you allowed them on the second-to-last play of that game to get all that extra yardage to set it up instead of playing defense properly and your defensive head coach. There are enough reasons to fire him after that game, but they didn't. They let it last, and it was the same thing with Grifo. Everybody knew that Pedro had to go to the point where we all had discussions all summer long about we know he needs to go, the team knows he needs to go, Getz seems to know he needs to go, but clearly Jerry doesn't want to pay him for too long to sit on the couch. I don't think it was exactly the same here with the Bears. I think what happened with the Bears was, and this is why Matt Eberflus has the press conference at 9 a.m. on Friday morning, I think Ryan Poles wasn't going to fire him. I think if you look at the statement and you look at Kevin Warren's statement, you have Ryan Poles saying that he had a meeting with Kevin Warren, with uh, with George McCaskey in the room, and that's when the decision was made. And I think Kevin Warren called the meeting after he realized that Ryan Poles hadn't fired the coach. Is whoa, 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 you're firing this guy. I don't care if you share an agent or not. We're done. I really think that's what happened. I think when you look at the Warren statement, it's, it's it, reading between the lines. He, he's trying to say Ryan Poles made this decision, but Ryan Poles made that decision because he was told if you don't make this decision, we're replacing you too. I really think that's how that went down. So it's a little different than with the White Sox, right? Oh yeah, and and it 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 never has happened to the Bears in years past. But there's also been a lot of years past where the Bears, quite frankly, you could look at the head coach and go, "Yeah, these players aren't playing up to their potential." You know, this guy's a disappointment. We don't have a quarterback. But literally, as the season has gone on, you started to see with the Bears, you started to see Caleb Williams emerging as you know as the talent that everyone thought he was going to be with the first pick in the draft. He's a real quarterback. That's the best quarterback I've ever seen the Bears have. Jay Cutler was around a little bit longer and was experienced and actually was very talented, even if you didn't like him. Uh, and, and Jim McMahon is my hero because I was alive for 1985 and old enough to remember it. And so I, that's my guy. And I think yesterday I was like, this is the best quarterback I've seen since Jim McMahon, who wasn't really a great quarterback, but they won. But this guy's a winner and he's talented. And that's the that's the difference with the White Sox. The White Sox don't have anybody like that on their team. Right. Like Pedro, Pedro wasn't holding back a superstar. I thought he was holding back Luis Robert Jr. And at the moment that Luis Robert Jr. got a new manager in there, 
then all of a sudden he'd stop brooding and he'd start hitting. But it turns out nothing could fix that guy's attitude, which is why they're shopping him this offseason. So it's not exactly the same there. No, exactly. So when you look at Matt Eberflus getting fired because the end of the Lions game was just the worst clock management possible. Like there's, there's no, and I know I saw tweets and stuff like that about, well, it's also on Caleb. He could have done this and that. I, I get it. But as the head coach, it's your job to immediately call timeout while there's two Detroit Lions defensive linemen sitting on top of Caleb Williams. Like that's the moment as the coach, when your hands are free, you sit there, go timeout. Holy crap. Somebody pick, pick Caleb off the turf. Let's, let's reset and, and, and spend these last 30 seconds either winning this game or sending it to OT. I mean, I got the idea of hurrying it up, right? And trying yeah. to get a play in. But when it became obvious very early on, I mean, look, everybody's Thanksgiving was exactly the same. Whether you were with friends, whether or not, whether or not you were getting ready to go to Thanksgiving, whether or not you were like me and I was already on my dad's couch because I decided to watch the whole game with him. And I, and the kids came over later. That's the nice thing about having older kids. I was like, yeah, drive, drive your two brothers over later. I'm going over to hang out with dad and have a couple beers before we even get into Thanksgiving. Right. But everybody's Thanksgiving was essentially the same. You're either surrounded by family with friends or you were just like, OK, we're doing this and then we're heading off. We were all yelling the same thing at our television. And, you know, this is the thing that I want to get to. This is why I bring up the Bears on a White Sox show. Why is it that Chicago sports ownership is so different than the rest of the country. Why is that? The the idea that a guy who was clearly in over his head and not good enough was brought back, featured on Hard Knocks, right? Because he grew a beard, so that made him smarter. That kind of logic's the same thing that keeps Pedro Grafol in place for the for the 2024 season, right? It's the same, it's the same logic. Same thing. Oh, he's got a plan. You know, we believe it. He's got a beard, he's got a plan. Right. Like he's he's coming in with a new attitude. Like, we, we can fix this. We can make him a better coach. You haven't given any reasons why he's going to be a better manager. But you're, that's what you were trying to sell us at the beginning of the year, right? And the Bears did the exact same thing. They did the same thing. Anybody paying attention, though, when they were watching Hard Knocks or if you're watching spring training with the White Sox could see that there was no difference. And in fact, right. when, when you heard Eberflus in those meetings, like Caleb Williams, I think, set a record for the most attempts without throwing an interception. And that's really cool. And they announced that during the game. But a lot of that comes from the fact that he's got a conservative head coach that's basically made him gun shy and afraid to throw the ball. And so a lot of that comes from the amount of times that he also took a sack, which leads the NFL. There's a, there's a correlation between it. And you saw it during hard knocks when, when Eberflus was sitting there basically like admonishing him for taking a risk and throwing something. And in the last couple of weeks, guess what? Somebody took the restraints off. Like they basically said, not only are we getting rid of the OC, but you, you're not involved in this anymore. Leave, leave the quarterback alone. I really feel like that's what was going on. But the problem is in the last two minutes, the head coach has so much power. That's why we're watching things end poorly after watching Caleb do amazing things beforehand. Like you, you hear that he says that his offensive coordinator essentially has been telling him at certain times, go be Superman. And that's what he needs, right? But this other guy comes in and messes it up. And it, it, it is comparable to the whole Grafol thing. You knew he was done. You knew he wasn't the right guy. You knew it was falling apart. The, the difference is you didn't have anybody. It wasn't like if you got rid of them, you were going to get more wins. I don't, I don't think we really expected that. I don't think you lose 121, though. I don't know. We brought in, you brought in Grady, and they still sucked, right? You, did, you didn't have anybody that, like, really came alive. Was there, was there one guy? Who, I mean, I guess Lenin Sosa started playing really well, right? Last, last month and a half when he got steady playing time, he started playing well. Yeah, Lenin Sosa though, that's his track record, is, is that it takes him a while to get used to a level and then he starts playing well. But you had to, you had to you had to you had to handle him right. Right? But I mean yeah. like, so it's, it, that isn't comparable to Caleb Williams, but I mean like you have to handle your players right. So there was there was a little change when you move on from him, but again, it's the stubbornness of ownership. It's the way that they run their teams, it's the culture of their teams. That that has been the biggest hang up in Chicago sports. Like as a Chicago sports fan. We live in a very weird sports market that I think is different from any other sports market. You can, might be able to say this about one team in your market, but you can't say it about all teams. And I don't really count the Cubs because they're not my team. I, I don't believe in this. There's two teams. So if you're a White Sox fan listening to this show, for us, all of our teams fall under the category of I'm just waiting for my owner to die. But and I will say this though that for the Cubs that was a that was a long time coming as well. Well, yeah, you were waiting for the Wrigley Company to let go of the team. You need the Wrigley, yeah, bill. the Tribune, you need, the Tribune, you need the Tribune company to, to die, let go. right? You need yeah. the Tribune to die. I need newspapers to die, and they died. So that was and one they thing. Died. And, right. and, it and dollar and, bill and Wurtz, Cubs, dollar bill Wurtz died, 
And when he died, we got lucky because the other brother was going to get the team and Rocky gave him the liquor distributorship and took the team and they won three, they won three championships. Right. And, and, but you had to wait for the owner to die. Virginia McCaskey looks like a sweet old lady. She has lived well into her hundreds and we're all waiting for her to die. I know that sounds morbid, but we are. Because they won't be able to keep that team underneath that family. There's too many parts of it amongst too many people, and they're not going to have 20 owners. And so they're, they're going to they're going to sell it. No. Something really different is going to happen. So we're waiting for her to die, and Bulls fans, uh, and, and mainly White Sox fans, are waiting for Jerry Reinsdorf to die as well. Because no matter what owner moves in there after Jerry, they'll be more competent as an owner. When you hear Chris Getz have to tell the story that they had to do a presentation to Jerry that we need to run things differently. And then you see this massive change behind the scenes. He's the roadblock, right? The McCaskies are a roadblock. Reinsdorf is a roadblock. Wurtz was a roadblock with the older one before he died. Like that's what the, that's unfortunately what Chicago sports has been now for decades upon decades. It's waiting for ownership to die because there's no hope until then. For exterior windows, doors, patio doors, and storm doors, look no further than Window and Door Superstore of Oak Forest, where there are no high-pressure sales. A lot of window places want to show up at your doorstep, want to pitch you something in your living room, want to force you to make a deal before they walk out the door. Forget that. Go into Window and Door Superstore in person, see everything live, no pictures in a book with an owner on site. There'll also be an owner on site when they do the install. All window and door superstore employees, they do not farm out the work on installation. For 40 years, they've been doing this, even more. In Oak Forest since 1985, all major brands custom made with no stock items for a perfect fit. Window and door superstore of Oak Forest is a half block east of 159th and Ridgeland at 6280 159th Street. See more at windowdooroakforest.com. Yeah, and if you're wondering about, well, you know, why wouldn't, the Reinsdorf family hold on to it. Why would, when Virginia McCaskey goes, why won't the McCaskies hold on to it? There's actually legal precedence to, to look at. When Papa Bear Hallis dies in the early 80s, okay, there is protracted, bitter litigation over his estate and over the future of the Chicago Bears at that point. And when it all settles out, here's Virginia, okay? And it's... It's, it's, it's a real issue, and it's going to happen again with the Reinsdorfs. It's going to happen again with the McCaskies when Virginia goes. It, it, may, it may even be worse for the McCaskies. So the best thing that they can do as a family is sit there and say, let's just take the money and go do something else with it, and, and let's, let's you know not have this issue. Plus, there's going to be some real pushback from fans if the new ownership that comes in Whoever it is, whether it's an outside group or whether it's it's a it's a an heir or a legatee, as you may want to call them, that that comes in if they don't come in right away and do something like say what the Ricketts family did and make changes and turn around and, and say, okay, this is a new regime, this is a new way of looking at this, this is new for everybody, the fans, for the owners, for for the players, for the front office. We're gonna do things differently. If it's the same old stuff, it doesn't work because we also have, for whatever reason, a lot of franchises in this town that have been historically just not successful for for so long and for such extended periods of time that we sit there with the Bears. We're still talking about 85. You mentioned Jim McMahon's your hero. I agree. Walter Payton, that entire defense, everybody, we, we still love the 85 Bears. Because it's all we have. It's all we have. have. It's, just like, it's just like we're going to cling to 05 forever until Jerry dies. And, and when you look at these, these front offices and you look at the structures and you look at the owners that were waiting for it to die, Kevin Warren is the voice of reason, I believe, inside of the Bears. I don't know very much about the guy. I really don't. And maybe I'm wrong. But I don't think Ryan Poles wanted to move on. There's a reason why there's already reports as we're sitting here recording this on Friday for Saturday that he's not having a press conference after he fired his coach in season. And it's the first right. in-season firing in 100 years for the Bears. And he shares, again, he shares an agent with the coach. And I don't think he really wanted to do this. And they, that, and it wasn't, it wasn't one of the McCaskies who did this. They are incapable of it. 
They're like, well, we're a charter franchise. We don't get rid of coaches in the middle we, of the season. Never done that. that coach could be running down the, down the middle of the field with his pants off. And we'd be like, well, there's wacky coach. He's our coach until the end of the year, though. Can't move on from him. They would never have done that. It's got to be Kevin Warren who did it. That, that, that's my gut. And it's the same gut feeling that I have about what's going on with the Sox right now. Getz was not the guy that I wanted. But he seems to be a Jerry whisperer. Like, he is able to steer the owner in a way that nobody else was able to do it. Kenny Williams held in such regard Jerry Reinsdorf. And there's a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff that's unconfirmed, folks. But you know what? Kenny got himself into some trouble over the 20 years that he was there. Jerry helped bail him out of it. That's the, that's the only way that I can talk about it without putting myself into some kind of trick bag. But, you know, my dad was a commander in the city of Chicago. I, I've heard a few stories. I, my, my uncle was a homicide detective out there. There were people, I know people in the state's attorney's office. I worked at a police department. Names get bandied about where you're like, oh, you hear this rumor about what happened the other night with so-and-so? And you hear this crazy, wild story. Jerry stuck with him. So Kenny held him in such regard, nobody was going to tell the old man no. And Rick Hahn was just happy to be there. He's a lawyer who all of a sudden got to run a baseball team with no qualifications, and it showed. Chris Getz is a former player who can see right away that there's something wrong. And while he probably wasn't the right hire looking at everybody in the world, he was the best hire you were going to get from Jerry Reinsdorf because he was at least smart enough to work his way through that building with Williams and Han and the nepotism of Williams putting his own son right there in direct contact with him. And he had to... Get the ear of the owner enough that when the owner fired those guys, the owner wanted him. Like he is a Jerry whisperer. He was able to get rid of Kenny's kid before Kenny was gone and not take flack because he had to have had some protection from the old man. He found a way to get in there while he was in there. He did a very good job of making connections. I'm not saying it's nefarious. I'm not saying he's a bad guy for doing it, but he seems to be skilled at least to be able to do that. And then he's skilled enough to understand, I don't know everything, so I'm bringing in people from the outside, and I have to find a way to convince this guy, who is so set in his ways over the last 40 years, that his ways are wrong. And he seems to have been able to do it when you look at all the firings and all the restructurings and all, the only thing he hasn't been able to figure out how to do is get him, get him to open up his pocketbook. And that's why when I look at these offseason moves, I still tend to believe it's a slow burn because Getz is trying to maneuver to get what he really wants this offseason out of Jerry. And that, so we're building a base. We're going with younger guys. We're working on structure. We're saving you money. Look at this, Jerry. I worry about your wallet. He's going to pop into his office at some point this offseason and say, I need, to, I need to get this $11 million relief pitcher so we can flip him. And I still am coming in well below what you wanted on your budget. He's the Jerry whisperer. He's doing it by whispering. And Warren is in there because he was brought in by the Bears to change the culture. And he probably looked at, at, at uh, uh, George McCaskey today and said, you brought me in here to change the culture. This is one of the things you're doing wrong. So I'm going, I, I'm going to tell Ryan Poles to fire this guy. Like, that's how it feels to me. As a fan on the outside looking in at both of these organizations, they both have a whisperer right now for ownership. And that's why we're getting some things that are happening you couldn't even have imagined five years ago. Well, and, and you wonder, too, you, you mentioned that this doesn't seem to happen in other markets with other with other teams, and, and I would submit that there's probably something to be said about other owners that are this myopic and stupid, right, when it comes to, to how they run their team and, and how short-sighted they can be and how they can make clear mistakes like not getting rid of head coaches that are clearly inferior in, in the middle of a season – and, you know, I mean, what are the Bears doing right now? They're giving Thomas Brown a tryout after he was very successful for a couple of games as the offensive coordinator. And, oh, by the way, your franchise quarterback loves the guy. So you have, I think, these opportunities in other markets for that type of stuff to happen. I mean, look at Dallas and Jerry Jones, for God's sakes. But in other markets, if there are guys that are whisperers to these owners, if there are guys within the organization, maybe it's the GM, Maybe it's a president or a vice president or something or other that we don't know about that can sit there and go, yeah, okay, I, I see what you're saying, but this would make a heck of a lot of sense from a business standpoint. And they speak the language and they know the verbiage and they know the syntax and they know exactly how to get what they want or what they need to make the franchise successful. There could be a lot of that where it's like, hey, we're successful in spite of ourselves or in spite of bad ownership. The fact that Jerry's not going to spend any money 
We talked about it when Chris Getz was hired when they were looking for a GM about how one of the things that they're going to have to do is understand what their budget is and understand that they are going to be operating as a small market team and be smart enough to be able to make choices that fit within that so that, like looking at where they are right now, a Jacob June is here and Austin Slater there to fill in some of the corners to leave yourself open for an opportunity maybe for a guy at an Andrew Benintendi-level contract who is going to be somebody who's going to help you longer term and is not just a throwaway guy. Or, like you said, an $11 million reliever that is going to help you potentially if, if somehow lightning gets caught in a bottle and you're competitive or is going to be a guy that you know you're going to be able to flip in the, in the, at the trade deadline or in the offseason if it's a couple-year contract and be able to, to use those assets and marshal those assets properly. One of the things that the White Sox never had, because Kenny Williams was bowing and kissing the ring without being smart enough to understand how to speak the language and, and how to use Jerry's pocketbook correctly, and this has happened with the Bulls, I think, to a certain degree too, in, in handing out max contracts under the NBA salary cap and those rules to the wrong guys. But what Chris Getz is doing by having, say, Ryan Fuller in place, by having Brian Bannister in place, by having Josh Barfield there with him, by focusing more on the scouting staff, by by turning this around and sitting there saying, okay, there's, there's certain types of guys we want in here. There's certain types of players we want in here. There's certain types of hitters we want everybody to be. There's certain types of pitchers we want everybody to be. We want to have a universal coaching staff where everything makes sense. You know, and all the stuff we're seeing that we've kind of sat there and gone, hey, I see what Chris Getz is doing here. One of the things that I think pops back around with it is spending the money correctly, not sitting there saying I'm going to hand out five and eight million dollar contracts to every pitcher in my bullpen because that's going to eat up what Jerry's willing to spend and finding cheap guys that you can plug into your bullpen and maybe one or two guys that you give a little bit more money to so that you can find somebody. It's the Junis thing. It's the it's the flexing thing last year i got corrected by a by a listener in a message last week after the last after the last episode and i i wasn't trying to say i don't like the idea of jake junis as a relief pitcher i just stupidly kind of thought to myself are they really going after him for like a starting role because they do need to add at least one starting pitcher That's but true. you're right you you know you're right if you think that you can get jake junis on the cheap and somebody's going to turn around and want him down the stretch He's a really sneaky signing because his whip was like at 0.83. I mean, it's like a closer's whip for a relief pitcher that could bolster a bullpen. And if you can get the same kind of results and he's with the the guy and Brian and Bannister that turned him around, then you're right. He is valuable and he is somebody you can flip. I just got myself kind of in that mode of go out and get the established superstar relief pitcher that's going to cost money because he's more of a sure thing. But the Sox might be looking at it as, we want to fill it up with multiple guys like that because nothing's a sure thing coming out of the bullpen. Like, they may actually be looking at it smarter than I give them credit for. Well, and again, Austin Slater, I think, falls under that that same role. I mean, here's a guy that is a bench guy, glue guy, not a starter, has had some success with you, you and I looked at. He's had some success with the Giants. People know around the league know who and what Austin Slater is. If he really was their top target, it's because they see something where they're like, okay, Fuller can turn him into... He's going to have a really great first half, and then he's going to be a guy that, if Getz doesn't botch the trade, which you know we have to, we have yet to see enough of a track record, I think, to really know. Like, is it true that he can only make trades in the off season? But he he panics at the deadline. But if if Getz gets something back good for him at the in in mid season, we're going to be looking at it going. That was a sneaky signing, right? So that's I think the one bit where you look at the White Sox and and going back to comparing to what we've seen out of the other franchises, including the Bulls, who who have Jerry as an owner, uh, regardless of the fact that his kid basically runs the show over there, does Chris Getz strike you as being enough of a Jerry whisperer that you feel confident that much like Kevin Warren is is starting to show for the Bears by by really making smart, cagey business moves with their stadium, you know, that whole deal. I mean, it, it... kind of was quietly announced that Kevin Warren came to an agreement finally on all the property tax issues with Arlington Heights. And that can only bolster what the McCaskies have access, you know, in terms of assets. The idea that Chris Getz, with the staff that he's put together, getting Will Venable, you know, the 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 guy that everybody wants to have as the next, you know, the next bright up-and-coming manager, 
giving these guys opportunities. Even Grady Sizemore, who was kind of plucked from doing an internship to being like, this guy really belongs on, on a major league coaching staff somewhere in some capacity. Is he canny enough to use all of this, all of his experience, all of his connections as a former player, what he went through as a guy that came up through the minors, was basically a quad A guy, had some run as a starter, for the most part was a guy that was a fringe major leaguer, and understands how a lot of these things go for players. Is he canny and cagey enough to be the guy that sits there and says, I just doesn't matter what Jerry does or doesn't let me do. I can do something here where we can sustain it year in and year out and at least be what Jerry said all those years ago. At least be the team that's probably going to finish second if they don't catch something and get the division. That music can only mean one thing. The Sox nerd, Dave Marin, puts all those tidbits and trivia nuggets up on the scoreboard at the rate and joins us each and every week, even on a holiday weekend here at Sox in the Basement. And he's brought to you by the Village of Lamont. Want to experience a downtown with real history, great eats and drinks, and green spaces filled with adventure? Visit the Village of Lamont. Shop, dine, drink, explore, see everything they have going on this holiday season. One of the best places to take a day trip, spend an evening, do some shopping, Have a blast. See it all at LamontDowntown.com and look for the brand new Lamont Unlocked podcast put on by this network, the Broadcast Basement On Demand Radio Network, starting in January of 2025. Nerd, what do you got for me? Chris, if recent events have proved one thing, it's that Andrew Vaughn is going to be around, at least for now. So with that in mind, here are a few nuggets on old Vaughn. Vaughn led the 2024 White Sox in eight offensive categories. Games, plate appearances, at-bats, runs, hits, doubles, RBIs, and total bases. His 140 hits were the lowest by a Sox full-season leader since Lamar Johnson's 136 in 1978, and his 55 runs are tied with Luis Aparicio's 1968 output for the lowest total to pace the Sox in a full season. Vaughn hit at least 15 home runs for the fourth straight season in 2024. He joins Jose Abreu, Carlos Lee, and Alexei Ramirez as the only Sox to hit at least that many bombs in each of their first four big league seasons. Vaughn ended 2024 with 72 home runs, which is third among players who played exclusively for the Sox behind Ron Karkovice's 96 and Luis Robert Jr.'s 88. The Cal product continued his hot hitting in Maryland in 2024. While he hit a career low in Baltimore, it was 375, and his 415 lifetime average there ranked second in Sox history to Dave Martinez's 455, while Vaughn's slugging percentage of 854 in Baltimore is a Sox record. Go figure. Besides his magnificence in Maryland, I tried really hard to find a category where Vaughn really thrived in 2024. It took me a while, but I found one. Andrew Vaughn was the best 2-0 hitter in the American League in 2024. Vaughn hit 600, that's 9 for 15, when the first two pitches in his at-bat were balls, and he swung. He actually tied Oakland's Brett Rooker for the AL lead here among players with at least 15 at-bats in that situation. So Will Venable, when it's 2-0, You let Andrew go. And then there were three. Vaughn, Crochet, and Robert are the only players on the current 40-man roster from the Sox 2021 playoff team. Before I get to my zinger, a reminder. You can access my blog at SoxInTheBasement.com, and there is plenty of Sox nerd material on Twitter. My zinger? No Sox players received any votes in the Writers' Awards this season. Believe it or not, this marks the first time any of the six 100 loss Sox teams have not scratched in any of the major awards voting. 100 loss Sox getting award votes in the past are Sullivan, Lyons, Appling, Aparicio, Palka, and Robert. That's it, Chris. More than you wanted to know about Vaughn, Carco, and Palkamania.
Meanwhile, I find it very interesting that while we're sitting here, I had this thought. I wonder if they've sold all the tickets to the Sox Fest Live yet in the small little oh, theater, right? Right? Like, I was yeah. like, by now they must be sold out for one of those days, right? By now, people people must be itching to buy tickets to go to something where you have no idea who's going to show up and what they're actually going to do there. And I know people have run out and bought their tickets. I know they have. But the fact that you don't have any days sold out yet, that you don't have, you don't even have those MVP tickets sold out yet that give you all the access, supposedly, because it's so vague. You're talking about a venue that's really small. Look, our friends over at the 108 do an event every year. I bet you they're able to sell out their event quicker than what the White Sox are doing right now. Well, I guarantee it. <laughs> like, like, it's kind of funny to me. If they didn't get that Sox fans are kind of like, Ugh, I just, you're not, you're not fooling me with this. They get it now. You have to think they get it now. It's the holiday season. You could be justifying buying these things as presents. It's Black Friday. You announced it on Tuesday, and I was able to go in right now and just kind of order whatever tickets I wanted to. I just didn't hit. I just didn't hit buy because the fees are insane too. <laughs> yeah, you forget about the fees that they add on to the ticket. Oh my goodness! Good luck to them. Good luck to them on the whole event. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on socksinthebasement.com.